done far more to sabotage the war effort of this country than it is possible for any newspaper to do. Now, when the Daily, Mirror, when the Daily Worker was first suppressed, I felt that the government was carrying out an inexpedient action. Although at that time I profoundly disagreed with the then policy of the Communist Party towards the war, I voted against the government on that issue. But what reasons are there today for the continuance of the ban on the daily worker? There can be no question about this. The Communist Party is honestly and sincerely and fully behind the war effort. I think we must all profoundly agree. But this act of Morrison's in continuing the suppression of the daily worker is far worse than that. By continuing the ban on the daily worker, Morrison is feeding those lingering suspicions that still exist in Russia about our wholehearted collaboration with them in this war. It no longer criticizes the men in the ranks and the junior officers all felt that the Daily Mirror was giving public expression to their anxieties and to their frustrations about the war effort. They felt that the Daily Mirror was expressing the doubts that they themselves had about the leadership of the army. Because one thing we must not forget, and that is this, that the men in the army today are a cross-section of the whole of the British community. They're as capable of putting two and two together to make four as any other section of the community. And I maintain that when the Daily Mirror gave expression to these criticisms of our military leadership, they were performing a valuable national service because they were giving the men in the, in the army a feeling that these anxieties of theirs, these frustrations of theirs, were receiving a public expression and they were being conveyed in some shape or form to the notice of the government. But what has happened now that Morrison has warned the Daily Mirror? I can tell you from the conversations, conversations which I haven't sought with men in the army, their feeling that the government has, prepared, has preferred to shut up the Daily Mirror rather than to carry out those changes at the top which are necessary for the efficient conduct of the war. And the army are as entitled as any other section of the community to understand and to have explained to them the views of people who do criticize the government's conduct of the war. Mr. Michael Foote. After the, Mr. Chairman, after the speech to which we've just listened, I come to this platform with very considerable trepidation. Uh, I fear that we, I hope you won't take Miss Macaulay's remarks too much to heart. I fear she's a more dangerous enemy of ours than even Mr. Morrison. <laughs> Mr. Winston Churchill, who happened to be a member of the government at that time, was talking the matter over with a colleague who was less eager than Mr. Churchill to pursue this campaign to the bitter end. And the colleague said to Mr. Churchill, well, supposing you go on with your campaign, supposing you do make war against Soviet Russia, and supposing the newspapers object, what will you do then? To which Mr. Churchill replied, in three brief words, square or squash. <laughs> now, I'd like to deal, first of all, Mr. Chairman, with the squaring process. <laughs> Ministers come and go, they are chopped and changed, and reshuffled with unfailing regularity and deafness, but one fact remains constant. Almost all ministers, of whatever political color, and especially when they're pink, <laughs> Almost all ministers read with avidity the bulky stack of press cuttings which are placed on their desks in their departments every morning. We know 
because we receive an equally bulky list of protests against remarks which might, which might be due and might be thought by the minister to be in somewhat bad taste. <coughs> Every editor in Fleet Street has to guard against this secret, underhand, labyrinthine method of dealing with the right to print. But that's not really what we are concerned about this afternoon. We're not concerned about the aesthetic objections to the uh, draftsmanship of David Lowe or even the literary style of the leader writer. We are concerned with more important matters. I only mention this subject in order that you may recall it to mind on the next occasion when you read of a cabinet minister making a speech in public on the freedom of the press. <laughs> if you read that uh, a cabinet minister has got up and said that despite the suppression of the daily worker and the threatened suppression of the daily mirror, it is still the resolve of the government, absolute, unflinching and firm, to maintain <laughs> responsible criticism in this freedom-loving country. If you read that speech made by a minister of the government, you may be pretty sure that the night before he's been raising hell with Lord Rothermere or Lord Southwood or even just occasionally with Lord Beaverbrook. <laughs> Lord discriminating jury, I say one newspaper has been squashed remains squashed, another newspaper is threatened. Action against those newspapers has been taken by the most arbitrary weapon at the disposal of the Home Secretary, and you know perfectly well that there's no lack of armaments in his armor. A weapon devised by the lawyers at the Home Office and sanctioned by Parliament only on the understanding that it would be used in the time of invasion. At the same time, the appeal to the courts has been deliberately and flatly rejected. Indeed, the Home Secretary has dismissed the whole of this business of appealing to the courts as a cumbrous and inconvenient mechanism. You would have thought that that fact might have occurred to those lawyers at the Home Office when they devised exactly this instrument of an appeal for the courts for dealing with newspapers that had offended against the proper prosecution of the war. Now, that's not all. We've already heard some reference to the, the crimes which the Daily Mirror was supposed to have committed. One was the publication of a cartoon upon which I think at least half the British people have put a different interpretation than that which was put upon it by Mr. Morrison and the oil companies. The ministers come along and tell us, have told us in the last two or three weeks, of course it's only the Daily Mirror they were trying to get at. The attack is over, they say. No more demands on any other newspapers. All other newspapers may continue to live in tranquility and in freedom and in peace. There's something rather familiar about those words. I have no more territorial demands. <laughs> I can picture in my mind's eye now Mr. Morrison himself muttering those words, I have no more territorial demands, <laughs> coming down Shoe Lane with a firm look on his jaw and a hot gun in his pocket with the evening standard safely suppressed under 2D and its proprietor safely looked after under 18B. <laughs> The Daily Telegraph, which in these days of clothes rationing we might describe as the utility newspaper or the maid of all work. <laughs> That's the sort of thing we are going to reach if we do not fight every, every time against these invasions of the press. The liberty of the press in this country can only be maintained by the vigilance of the people and the vigilance of Parliament and the courage of the newspapers themselves. That's the only way. Therefore, we must fight fight, fight to retain those liberties. There are only two methods by which governments may seek to maintain the fighting spirit of a nation in war. There is the German method whereby all fact and opinion is disseminated from one supreme fountainhead. So far that German system has worked. I don't think it will work forever. I don't believe that, that the Germans under their method 
could have survived a series of military disasters such as the British people have survived during the past two years. And I don't believe that under the German method, the Germans would survive this year, 1942, if all the power of the Allies were concentrated against them. <laughs> However, for the German way, there is a great deal to be said for the British way. There is nothing whatsoever to be said for an amalgamation of the two. That was the French way, and that's the why reason why France went down. I believe, I believe that the... I was on a boat that carried petrol. It was a British boat. We put Chinese seamen into prison for refusing to sail. But those Chinese seamen, I don't think they got war risk money. We did. The English seamen got war risk money. The freedom I want for this world is that an equal wage should be paid to a tradesman, whatever nationality. Yeah, yeah. The fruits of this world are God's and they should be used by the people of all nations without let or hindrance from any big vested interests. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, I think I ought to begin by explaining why it is I've been induced to leave the privacy of the obscure retirement which I so long enjoyed in the academic shades of the BBC <laughs> for the glare of the public platform. I say what's induced me? But you know, I think I ought to say who has induced me because the answer is it's that man Morrison. Now, you know, I'm happy in the shades of the BBC, but I'm nervous, shy, and embarrassed in the glare, I speak quite literally, in the glare that beats upon us on this platform, and therefore I'm angry with Mr. Morrison in digging me out and making me come here. I don't know if you remember the general strike of 26, I see quite a number of people in this, in this room didn't remember it because they were in their cradles at the time. But just for the benefit of those people, let me say there was a general strike in 1926. <laughs> and quite a number of people thought that it was going to lead to revolution until it was found that the strikers were playing football with the police and there was no revolution. <laughs> well, I don't really know if you remember, in that strike, nearly all forms of transport were commandeered either by the government or by the Trade Union Congress. And lorries, in particular, seem to have been taken over, monopolized by the Trade Union Congress, and used to drive about all over the place, covered, very importantly, with great posters saying that they were driven by permission of the TUC. I remember going down the Strand one day in the middle of the strike, and there came thundering past, an even larger lorry than usual, driven by a little wiry man with red, stubbly red hair standing up all over his head, in a little uh, mustache, two brush moustache, ends beautifully curved, pretty cockney, and on the bonnet of his lorry, an even larger notice, saying, I'm going to swear at you now, it's not me, it's the lorry driver, <laughs> driven by my own bloody permission. <laughs> a change, you know, we all know it, in terms of which, instead of thinking, as they ought to do, that they're there for our benefit, to suit our convenience, to minister to our needs, to promote our welfare, to do what we want done, they somehow get it the other way around. 
I think we are there for their benefit, to minister to their convenience, to promote their welfare, to redound to the glory of the particular institution that they happen to re represent. In other words, to sign our forms and get out of the office and not be a nuisance. Well, now, that is the kind of thing, that tyranny of officials, which has always been resented in this country. And these men to whom I'm referring, and the many of us are gathered in this room today, these men to whom I'm referring know that tendency of officials. They know, here's another phase of Mills, that the price of liberty is perpetual vigilance and are prepared to be perpetually vigilant on its behalf and have no respect for officials. They still exist in this country. They exist perhaps in Yorkshire more than anywhere else. If I may just uh, tell a story, quite obviously off the record, in this I believe people when they said that this was a war for liberty. I believe, for example, Lord Simon, who said, <laughs> told you I was innocent. <laughs> I even believed Lord Simon, who said, nobody, nobody in their senses, nobody with any respect for English history, nobody with the most elementary understanding of British liberties would dare to impeach or attack the liberty of the press. And God help him, he said it last week. <laughs> well, now this man, Morris, has pricked the bubble, blown the gap, <laughs> and brought me to a state of disgruntled disillusion. You see, all the kind of things which seem to me to be totally abominable in a state one by one are creeping into the administration of this war. One by one, the symptoms of dictatorship begin to appear. <laughs> How more harm is done to morale by taking the heart out of us, by making us suspicious of the government, by making us believe that things are held from us, by making us realize that censorship is beginning in this country too, by making us suspect that we're becoming a country like Germany, in which whatever is not forbidden is compulsory. <laughs> that ominous phrase, is Mr. Morrison so sure that he is suppressing the Daily Mirror because of its opposition to the successful prosecution of the war? Supposing it were because of his, its opposition to the unsuccessful prosecution of the war. And that seems to me to be very much in the other mark. Well, now, I've given you my own case. And I'm sure I'm typical of hundreds of thousands of people in this room. We all believe that if these liberties are being taken away from us, then this war is not for us worth fighting. An imaginary conversation at the end of this war, which my advanced spies have reported to me. <laughs> it's a conversation between three dictatorial gentlemen, of whom two are discussing between themselves the division of the spoils. I claim half the surface of the earth, says Mussolini. The Almighty promised it, promised it to me. Not so, says Hitler. I claim the whole surface of the earth. The Almighty promised me the lot. I did no such thing, said Mr. Morrison. <laughs> to uh, think about what will be the reactions of the Home Office before we speak. Now, the reason why this meeting has been held, and I hope many meetings will be held like it throughout the country, is, is because you must remember, critics are always in a small minority. Critics are not necessarily a small group of bitter, frustrated people. They are a small group of people who can withstand 
one of the most powerful instincts within us all, and that is the herd instinct. The herd and uh, once the country, once the herd approves this suppression, it will be a short step before the individual is suppressed. <clears throat> we have always said on looking at Europe, as we have seen one country after another lose its liberties, we have proudly said, but it can't happen here. But here we see uh, the Daily Mirror, here we see the perpetual sadistic suppression of the daily worker. Yeah. <laughs> a suppression which I believe has been a grave mistake. Yeah. And uh, if these encroachments on our liberties are, are, are tolerated, then it will not be long before everybody on this platform is muzzled and meetings of this kind are broken up. <laughs>